I'm sure that all of these um, forums, many of which I attended as a student here, uh, are dramatic and provocative, but I think that the topic and the timing uh, of this event gives it special meaning. An increasing number of, of people recognize that we are reaching a point of no return uh, for America's children. We are, I think as a society, justifiably afflicted with a bad conscience because as Lafayette Rivers says in Alex's book, everything that goes wrong keeps going on and everything that's right doesn't stay right. When one-fourth of America's boys and girls under the age of six live in poverty, it's not just children, but the entire nation that is in crisis. For me, and I think for many people, the way out begins when we hear the voices and see the faces of individual children involved. of Mary Jo Bain and David Elwood. This forum is linked to emerging efforts for children all across America and to the work of the National Commission on Children. The commission concluded its recent report with the saying, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. The Boston Foundation and the Endowment in children, uh, for Children in Crisis celebrates the knowledge of this evening's panel and stands ready to apply and to do what must be done now for America's children. I'm very glad uh, and relieved since I don't organize these forums and, and to discover that there is, appears to be a standing room only audience for this uh, presentation. I'm delighted you're here. I look forward to uh, working with you and, and like you look forward to a great evening of uh, presentations. Thanks very much for coming. You folks don't want to hear me speak, and you uh, don't want more introductions. And somehow is poignant and, and uh, reflects in the simple way, oftentimes, uh, the darker and more important realities that face us all. And I think there's just no question that. Uh, Alex Potwitz's book, There Are No Children Here, does that. Um, the other, uh, it, he has a uh, very interesting and diverse background, ranging from having been a com community organizer in Atlanta uh, and uh, working as a, uh, in a settlement house and so forth, to his current job, which is a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, um, which is maybe one of the most hopeful signs for American capitalism today. Uh, the book, There Are No Children Now, uh, as I'm sure we'll hear, uh, chronicles the, the uh, events really of two children, of one family, uh, in one of the worst housing projects in this country. It's a book that's received the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award and countless other uh, awards and recognition and so forth. Uh, the other uh, intriguing thing about uh, uh, Alex Kotlowitz is last night he stayed in John F. Kennedy's old room in Kirkland House. So uh, we have a Wall Street Journal reporter who was in the uh, uh, one of the world's worst housing projects um, who received the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award um, talking about our children. So I think here's a voice to, to listen to. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me here tonight. I'm um, honored to be here and honored to be in Kennedy's uh, old dorm room. I, I thought what I would uh, talk about tonight somewhat informally is some of my observations, some of the things that surprised me during the course of working on my book and working with the children on the west side of Chicago and talk a little bit just briefly and perhaps we'll get into it more later about some thoughts about where we go from here. I want to start off by recounting an uh, episode that occurs early in my book. And for those of you who haven't read it, the book follows two young boys, Lafayette and Farrow, who when the book opens, Lafayette is 12 and Farrow is nine years old. And the two brothers, it's a summer afternoon, they live in a public housing complex on the near west side of Chicago. It was built in the mid-50s. 
And the two boys decide they want to hunt for garter snakes. And uh, like most urban kids, and I was once one myself, they hadn't the slightest idea where to begin looking. And so decided that they would go to some nearby railroad tracks to hunt for these snakes. And they took with them six friends and some crowbars because they figured they would dig for these snakes. And while they were up on the railroad tracks, a commuter train began to wend its way from downtown Chicago to the western suburbs. And during the course of working on the book, I had a number of friends who lived in the western suburbs, and they would tell me that as they would ride through these blighted neighborhoods, that they would purposefully sit away from the windows because that they were afraid that people might shoot at them or that the children might throw rocks at them through those windows. Well, as that train began to wend its way to the western suburbs and towards the children, the kids panicked. Lafayette and a friend of his hoisted themselves into a boxcar. A couple of the kids hid behind the boxcar's wheels, and Pharaoh and his cousin Porkchop, who were quite small at the time, flung themselves into the high weeds. And one of the boys was so afraid that he burst into tears. And what they were so afraid of is that they had heard rumors that the suburban commuters from behind their tinted windows were going to shoot at them as the train made its way through their neighborhood. And for me, that one incident is a kind of metaphor for the enormous gap between the two Americas and between the races. I remember uh, that gap was reinforced to me shortly after my book came out when I had a colleague of mine, a friend who, who uh, covered the Vietnam War in the 60s uh, after finishing my book said to me, it was as if I had parachuted behind enemy lines. And I thought about that. I didn't parachute, and nor did I cavort with the enemy. And in fact, all I did was drive a couple of miles to spend time with the people who in more civilized times would be considered my neighbor. And so it's that gap that I hope we can begin to find ways to bridge, and that I hope in my remarks that you'll keep in mind tonight. One of the first things that surprised me in spending time in, in the Henry Horner homes was what I can only call a breakdown in a sense of community. I perhaps somewhat naively assumed that there would be a strong sense of neighborhood and in fact had heard stories, perhaps apocryphal, of families given the opportunity to leave public housing or to leave an inner city community deciding not to leave because of strong roots, strong family roots, strong roots with friends. In fact, what I found was just the contrary. I expected to find an enormous amount of distrust towards outsiders like myself. What I did not expect to find was that same distrust between neighbors. I remember when I first began to spend time with Lafayette in 1987. He was 12 years old at the time. And I had asked him whether he wouldn't introduce me to some of his friends. And Lafayette said to me, I don't have friends. I just have associates, friends you trust. Now, that was a 12-year-old boy speaking. I also assume, perhaps somewhat naively, that the family I spent time with who didn't have a telephone could use the phone of the neighbor across the hall or the neighbor upstairs. And in fact, they had to go two blocks to use the nearest phone. It is a very disturbing distrust, a very disturbing, I think, breakdown in a sense of community. And it says something to me. We spend an enormous amount of time talking about the family. And we need to continue talking about the family, but I think we also need to find ways to begin to address issues of community, the issue of community. I can tell you that Henry Horner, the Henry Horner Homes, the community I spent time in, at one point in the mid-1970s, there were 13 social service agencies. And today, there are only two. It is a neighborhood like many similar communities where there is very little uh, political organization. The other thing that strikes you as you walk into a community like Henry Horner is not so much what is there, but what isn't there. There are no banks, for example, just currency exchanges. There are no movie theaters, no libraries, no skating rinks for the children. The church is no longer the factor that it once was. In fact, the irony at Henry Horner is that the southern edge of the neighborhood is lined by half a dozen churches, and yet most of the congregations come from other neighborhoods. They are people who, understandably, long ago left for greener and safer pastures. In fact, I remember one of the congregations there, one of the churches, was very uh, uh, 
played a very large role in trying to get some promises from a new stadium that was being built in the community. And the one thing that they wanted assurance of is that they would have enough parking. The other thing I found is an enormous amount of loneliness, and I don't mean this necessarily in the conventional sense, uh, but I mean a kind of lonely, a kind of emotional loneliness, a sense particularly among the children about not knowing when it was okay to grieve, when it was okay to laugh, when it was okay to cry. And I think that that loneliness also had a way of dissipating any sense of community that existed. I also found loyalties, particularly among the children, that were enormously divided. And I remember experiencing this firsthand myself when, after I had finished reporting the book and was in the process of writing it, I had gone over one Saturday afternoon to ask Lafayette if he wouldn't go out to lunch with me. And, and Lafayette had a friend there named Isaac, and he asked if Isaac could join us. And I said, sure. And I asked Isaac to go home and ask his mother and make sure it was okay. After Isaac left, a couple of minutes later, there was a knock on the door, and Lafayette and I went to the door to open it, and there were two police officers, a man and a woman in uniform there, and they had with them a picture of Isaac, and said to Lafayette, and said to me, we're looking for this boy, have you seen him? Lafayette said, no, I haven't seen Isaac in a few days. And I said absolutely nothing. Now, I can tell you, if that had happened just a year or two earlier, there is no question in my mind that I would have asked the police why they were looking for Isaac, and assuming it was some credible and legitimate reason, would have said not only has Isaac just been here, but he'll be back in a few minutes. And I realized at that point how divided my loyalties had become in just the time I had spent out in Henry Horner, my loyalties to the authorities who I had grown up and taught to trust, my loyalties to a dear friend, Lafayette, my loyalties to Isaac, a boy I hardly knew, and my loyalties to my own instincts. And I thought about how divided the loyalties of a 12-year-old boy like Lafayette must be in a situation like that. So one of the things I think we need to keep in mind as we talk about our children is the issue of community. The other thing that I I saw that did not surprise me that it existed, but surprised me in its intensity and disturbed me greatly, was the effect of the violence on the children. During the course of my book, Lafayette, which takes place over two years, Lafayette and Farrell lost three friends, all 19 years of age and younger, in very violent ways. Shortly after I finished reporting the book, Lafayette watched as a friend of his, a young friend of his, stumbled out of a high-rise clutching his stomach after being shot. Farrell, shortly after I finished reporting the book, watched a friend of his shot in the back of the neck. Both boys had a friend of theirs shot in a stick-up attempt at a local restaurant. These are boys who are 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, who see more than most of us will see in a lifetime. I remember, again, the first time I met Lafayette back in actually 1985, and I asked him what I thought was a fairly natural question to ask of a 10-year-old boy. And I asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up. And Lafayette said to me, if I grow up, I want to be a bus driver. If, not when, there is a great foreboding among many of these children that they won't make it to adulthood. What I saw in the children after talking to a number of child psychologists was the same kind of post-traumatic stress disorder that we saw in veterans returning from combat in Vietnam. We saw children who were much more aggressive. We saw children who, in fact, had flashbacks. There's a boy in my book, Ricky, who at the age of 12 watched as his older cousin was shot and died on the lawn outside of his high rise. And he, Ricky was a boy who has a terrible temper. And when he would begin to get angry, he would tell me that he would relive in his mind the death of his cousin up until the very moment when he died. And this same boy, a year later, at the age of 13, said to me, I wish I was eight years old again. Here is a boy wishing for his childhood back. I saw children who were hyperactive. You hear this constantly, constant complaint from teachers in the public schools of children who are bouncing off the walls. Well, hyperactivity is a direct result of experiencing all this trauma. I saw children who were depressed. If you look at the picture of Lafayette inside the cover of the book, you see a 12-year-old boy who has bags under his eyes. I saw children who had physical ailments as a result of bearing witness to all this violence. Lafayette 
got regular stomach aches, Faro, got regular headaches when the gunfire would become more frequent. I also, as I mentioned earlier, saw children who felt very alone and how they felt. I went to two funerals with Lafayette during the course of the book, and during both funerals, he was unable to cry. I remember thinking to myself early on, after my first few months out there, uh, I, I got very depressed, and I used to come home at night sometimes and would just cry thinking about the kids and worrying about them and thinking, wondering whether I should or could go on and write this book. And ultimately, that depression, or at least much of it, turned to an indignant fury. But I remember thinking back then, wondering to myself, why there were no suicides in a community like Henry Horner, why I didn't hear of instances of people taking their lives, because I knew how depressed I had become in just three months spending time out there. And as I thought about it, I began to realize that in some ways, the paths that many of these children choose is a kind of slow suicide. The gangs, the drugs, the criminal activity. In a way, in a very real way, they are giving up on themselves. I strongly feel and strongly argue, and in fact there's somebody here at, at Harvard, Deborah Prothero Stith, who is really uh, sort of the uh, preeminent spokesperson on this. We need to begin to deal with the issue of violence as an issue of public health. Well, we can see that these children are experiencing a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder. What we don't know is what the long-term effect will be, whether in fact, because they indeed are children, because perhaps they will be more resilient, that they'll somehow be able to shed some of these traumas and some of these scars. Or whether, as I suspect was more, pro more probably the case, because they are children, because their personalities are still forming, that it won't leave much deeper scars than the adults returning from combat. The other thing I want to talk about briefly is the issue of silence. And I want to talk about two kinds of silences that I experienced in my time at Henry Horner. One which may seem somewhat obvious and the other perhaps not so obvious. The obvious one is the institutional silence, the silence of the very institutions meant to serve these children, the silence of institutions like the police, like the public housing authority, the juvenile courts, the Department of Public Aid. And I think if my book has any theme, it's that institutional silence toward these children, the silence that surrounds their life. I don't want to dwell on this kind of silence because I think it's a fairly obvious kind of silence and something that we have lived with for a long time in this country. The other kind of silence, though, which is perhaps not so obvious and which I'd like to talk a little bit about and something that I did not begin to come to terms with until after my book was published is a kind of self-imposed silence on the part of people living in communities like Henry Horner. And I didn't begin thinking about this until shortly after my book came out and I was on tour and was being interviewed by a black reporter a couple of years younger than myself. And I was talking with him about the institutional silence. And as I was talking, I looked up and saw tears in his eyes. And he said to me, you know, I grew up in public housing in Detroit, and I have never spoken to my wife of those years. And I thought about that a little bit and realized that during the two years that I had taken off from the paper to work on this book, that I found it difficult, if not impossible, to talk to even the closest of my friends about all that I had seen and all that I had heard. Now, part of it was, as I know, I was unable or didn't quite know what to do with all my emotions. But as I think back upon it, I think much of the reason was is if I began, I began to feel that if I told my friends all that I had seen and all that I had heard, that they might not believe me. And I think this is a very important thing that we have to keep in mind, this issue of believability. I thought more about it and remember the very first time I met Lafayette, which was in 19, the summer of 1985, and I interviewed him for all of two hours for a uh, magazine piece I was doing on children growing up in poverty in Chicago. And Lafayette was 10 years old, and I remember him telling me about a young girl who he had seen shot in the leg, caught in crossfire. She was skipping rope in front of his building, and about an older boy who had been shot in a gang war and came and died on the stairwell, stairwell right outside of his apartment. And I remember Lafayette told me these two stories without much affect. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, 
I don't know that I fully believe this boy. And I remember thinking, as I think back upon it, Lafayette must have sensed the fact that I didn't believe him because I remember, and I remember it as if it happened yesterday, he took me by my arm and pulled me out into the hallway into the stairwell to show me the bloodstains on the stairs to make me believe. And in fact, that was the reason that I went back two years later with the Wall Street Journal to spend a summer with Lafayette to chronicle the violence in his life. I could go on and on about stories, about this kind of self-imposed silence, this feeling, this sense among people living in communities like this that if they begin to tell the horrors of their life, that people will not believe them, and as a result have remained silent. Uh, I will just tell you one uh, couple of other quick stories where it came up. I remember shortly after my book came out, the head of the Henry Horner's Boys Club got a phone call from one of the executives of the Boys Club in Chicago and said, I've just read this book on Henry Horner. He says, I can't believe all this goes on. And the director had to get another staff person on the telephone to convince this person that, in fact, if anything, if anything, my book understated all that took place in those two years in that community. More recently, a few months ago, I, we've been fortunate enough to sell the book as a made-for-TV movie. And the screenwriter came out to spend a few days, and I was to be his tour guide on the west side, a very quiet, uh, soft-spoken, gentle man. And, uh, and as we began to spend time together, he didn't ask many questions. I began to have this eerie feeling that he didn't believe my book. And so I took him to the worst high-rises. I would take him to the worst street corners, trying to show him the worst of that community. And on our last day, he and I and a couple of friends of mine, a couple of young women who live in a neighboring public housing complex, went out to lunch at a soul food restaurant, Edna's, on the west side of the city. And while we were sitting there eating lunch, a young boy, maybe 15 years old, ran into the restaurant and ducked behind the radiator in the window. And as he ducked, a group of kids outside the restaurant ran by, and one of them yanked a pistol out of a paper bag and started shooting into the restaurant. And needless to say, we were, say we were all scared for our lives and ducked under our table, but I remember all I could think to myself was, is now he's going to believe me. <laughs> I can't tell you or emphasize enough that this kind of silence is perhaps the most painful and destructive kind of silence there is. And it's the kind of silence that will slowly strangle the life out of an otherwise spirited people. And what it says to me, and says to me very strongly, is that we have stopped listening. We have stopped believing. And I think if we do nothing else in the coming year, it's that we begin to listen again to the people living in these communities. Let me just talk briefly, having said this, about some of my thoughts about where I see us going from here and why, while I may not be optimistic, I am at the moment hopeful. First of all, I think we're at a somewhat unusual historical juncture as a nation. And coming out of a decade of great self-indulgence and greed, and some might even say decadence, and a nation looking, searching for some sense of direction and purpose. I also think that out of the vacuum of the past 10, 15 years, when our government has turned its backs on the people who most need it, that there have emerged some very sophisticated and technically skilled community-based organizations. Most notably, uh, I point to the Community Development Corporation, uh, a, a group that at its best both builds new housing and rehabs old housing and provides services for people living in a community, provides activities for kids, and works in a holistic way, works with the police, with the health care system, uh, in an effort, though it may not be articulated this way, but in an effort to rebuild a sense of community, both physically and spiritually. And I think we need to find ways to rebuild these communities, both physically and spiritually. I think we need to take a look more closely at the role of the schools, particularly the elementary schools. The schools particularly the elementary schools, are the one institution in these communities remaining with some semblance of respect and dignity. And we need to find ways to build on that. We need to find ways to keep these schools open in the afternoon and evening so the kids can come in and, and have a place to play or to do homework, or a place where adults can come in for adult education, 
It's a place where people can feel comfortable, and we need to find institutions like the schools upon which we can use as a foundation for rebuilding community. I also just want to say in passing, and perhaps we'll get into this later, that I would be remiss if in all this I didn't also suggest that it is also going to take some financial investment on the part of our federal government uh, if we are to be seriously begin addressing these issues. Um, and we need to find ways, creative ways, to use that money and to build on institutions like the community development corporations or the schools that already exist. I just want to conclude with a, a few remarks. I want to, first of all, tell you that my greatest hope and my greatest source of optimism, if there is that optimism, are the kids. I expected when I went in to write this book, and I had decided early on to focus on kids who had not quite entered adolescence, kids 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, I expected to find a lot of the kids, not Lafayette and Farrell, but their friends who were involved in the, in the gangs or involved with drugs or criminal activity. And I found some of those kids. But what I found, for the most part, were children who had a very strong sense of right and wrong, children who had a very strong sense about what they wanted to be and didn't want to be when they grew up, children who still had a vision, however blurred it might be, children who were resourceful, children who were still questioning the world around them. And it wasn't until these kids got older, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, that the currents became so strong that it was difficult, if not impossible, for them to swim against them. But it was in those children that I found my inspiration, and it was those children in those early months who kept me going. I just want to end with a couple of words of warning. Um, First of all, I think it's very important that as we discuss these issues and discuss these communities, that we not be lazy and glib in discussing them. And I will just give you two quick examples of what I mean. First of all, it, it, uh, it, it irritates me at times when I hear people glibly suggest that the kids at Henry Horner are so deprived because they've never been to Lake Michigan or, or to the University of Chicago or to Wrigley Field. And the reason it irritates me is because we have to remind ourselves that children, most children's universes are very small. I grew up on 78th Street on the west side of New York, and I remember when I was 13 and the students at Columbia had taken over the buildings there, and it was on TV almost every night, and I hadn't the foggiest idea where Columbia University was. <laughs> we have to remind ourselves that kids' universes are very small, and the horror of it is not that it is so small, but what their universe is. The other thing that irritates me often is the constant comparison of these neighborhoods to war zones. These neighborhoods are not war zones, and in fact there are big differences between neighborhoods like Henry Horner and a place like Belfast, for example. In a place like Belfast, as violent as it is, and at times much more violent than even the most violent of our inner cities, there's at least a sense that things might be different, that there might someday be a resolution of the conflict. That is not necessarily the case in a place like Henry Horner. There's not much sense that things could be better. There's no vision as to how this so-called war might be resolved. And I ask you that if these are war zones, and if indeed there is a war on drugs, then who is the enemy? During the course of my book, I, I came across a, um, uh, a quote uh, by something Victor Hugo had written, and uh, as I was reading it, I felt it was something that I had to constantly remind myself of in dealing with the children, and in fact, I ripped that, uh, this is unusual for me, but I ripped it out of the book and put it in my wallet and still carry it around with me today as a reminder. And what Victor Hugo wrote, and it was something that Martin Luther King often referred to in his speeches, he wrote, if a soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. The guilty one is not he who commits the sin, but he who causes the darkness. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Just <clears throat> thank you for an extraordinary uh, presentation or an, an extraordinary book. Our next speaker, in some ways, uh, has a resume that's like 90% uh, of the speakers that seem to show up on this platform. Um, Harvard Medical School, they don't all go to Harvard Medical School, but they, uh, something of that sort, teaches at the college, teaches the law school, professor uh, at the, of psychiatry, uh, a variety of other things. But I think, as you can already see by the expression of his reaction, uh, that isn't who Robert Coles really is. Um, indeed, I think, uh, for me, uh, it was nothing more evident that I, a year or two back, uh, he asked me to come over and meet with him, talk about a course uh, he was trying to do, we might do together, whatever. Um, this course was nerve-wracking for me. I knew he gave the best undergraduate course at the college. Um, but um, he was late. Uh, the reason he was late was that he was at a second grade class teaching the class. And that is who Robert Coles is far more than any of the other things. Um, I thought Alex's comments about silence were extraordinary. And uh, this is one man who somehow has found a way to hear through the silence, who has used pictures, whose speech, everything about our children and heard their views and their thoughts and used it as a mirror on us all. He's the recipient of all kinds of awards, ranging from a Pulitzer Prize, a MacArthur Fellowship, a Catholic Book Award, and so on. But as I say, in the end, this is a man whose real joy, I think, is dealing with young people and listening to them and hearing them. And our great joy is that he also tells us what he hears. Robert Coles. There have to be some uh, advantages to getting old. And as I was listening to Alex talk, I was thinking of uh, some of the families that I met in the early 1960s at the height of the civil rights struggle. They were in the rural South, in Mississippi and in Louisiana. They were living under segregationist laws. They were extremely poor, and the country had made absolutely no commitment toward them. This was before there were even the minimum kind of welfare requirements that we have now in all of our states. And this is before Medicare and Medicaid and the whole panoply of reforms instituted by President Johnson, essentially, after the assassination of President Kennedy. These were people who were, in the main, voteless. Voteless without the most elementary rights of American citizenship. I stumbled into them in my life in New Orleans on my way to a medical conference, having been drafted into the Air Force to run a psychiatric hospital in Biloxi, Mississippi in the late 1950s. And stumbling into them, I got to know them, rather in the way that Alex has gotten to know families, years later, decades later. Now, there is an irony here. These were the poorest of the poor. The children I first knew who started school desegregation in New Orleans came from the most humble of homes. They were born in the Delta of Mississippi, two of them. They were born in the slums of New Orleans, two of them. One of them was delivered by her great aunt. The other delivered in the emergency ward of a hospital in the Delta. Their parents were utterly illiterate. They did not know how to read or write, three out of the four sets of parents. So we would have every right to look upon such people from our point of view now and say, my Lord, what this country has failed to do for its citizens, for its families, for its children, semicolon, not period, not exclamation mark, but semicolon. And yet, a federal judge plucking names out of a list of names, administering no tests, not trying to find any kind of elite by chance selects four families, sends them into a mob in front of two elementary schools, 
And what happened to them? And what does someone like me see and hear? And then writes about courage, resiliency, steadfastness in the face of all sorts of terrible provocations. Then the observer wanders and goes to Atlanta and goes to Alabama and Mississippi and meets more children and more families still poor, still vulnerable, still engaged in a very momentous political struggle and a social revolution of sorts in a region all too readily despised elsewhere in this country, the impoverished South, the homeland for the black people of this country, the nation within a nation for them, and continues to find what we all know is our history, the civil rights movement, not only the movement of Dr. King and his associates, but the movement of the ordinary people, the families and the children who in city after city initiated this school desegregation. Now as I look back at that work, the drawings and the paintings and listening to what I heard and look back at what I myself wrote about this, I have to remember, I have to remember what I just interestingly enough heard Alex concluding his presentation. I have to remember the courage, the resiliency, his word, the capacity in some way to make do under these kinds of terrible stresses. As I talk to those one-time children who are now parents, I keep up with some of them, who now have their children, I hear them say, another irony, I hear them say, that they had it much better than their children. And what do they mean by that? Their children are not fighting their way through mobs. They can vote, and so will their children be able to vote. Many of these families are now members of the middle class, the black bourgeoisie, so-called. What do they mean? And here, maybe they join hands with lots of other people who are not living in ghettos, who are white and privileged. They talk about television. They talk about the collapse of moral values in this country. Ruby Bridges, who some of you have heard me talk about, I'll be talking about her probably in my deathbed, this little girl who for me was such a moral heroine of sorts, who had a face such a violent mob for so long in a totally boycotted school, now has four children of her own. She works for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Her husband is an accountant and a lawyer. But she worries about her children rather the way I suspect many of us worry about our children. And she is not at all happy about what's been happening in this country for all children. She, if you listen to her and listen to others like her of her generation, is worried about a moral collapse of sorts. I used to go into parts of Mississippi in the Delta that I guess are about as down and out regions of this country as one can find, and we know that from that delta came the movement to the parts of Chicago that Alex has been in and tried to comprehend. And I have heard Ruby's mother, and I have heard grandparents of some of these one-time children talk with a certain nostalgia about the old days, days that I happen to remember, when as poor as these communities were, what was missing? There was some endemic alcoholism, there was some violence, but there were families that were 
largely intact. There was not the high incidence that we have now of single parent families. There were men around in every home that I visited. There were men. There were fathers. Or if there were not fathers, there were men who had sired children and took some responsibility for them. I remember the first 10 black families singled out by Judge Hooper in Atlanta in 1961, sent into four high schools. Again, fatefully chosen, randomly chosen, by residents in proximity to the high schools. Some of them very poor and very vulnerable. But the families were intact. My wife and I just the other day were thinking about that. What has happened? And is this something that has only happened to poor and ghetto families? Or is there a moral question for the country to contemplate? Half of our marriages end in divorce. Half of them. This is not only a ghetto problem. Nor is the use of drugs only a ghetto problem. We know, and maybe with a certain sense we're proud to know, considering ourselves compassionate and thoughtful, about the sorrows and the vulnerabilities and the deterioration in this neighborhood or that neighborhood. Do we know and do we acknowledge what happens in other neighborhoods? I've talked with policemen who work in affluent suburbs. I've talked with families in affluent suburbs. I've gone to private schools and talked with those who teach there and work there in various ways. The doctors, the headmaster, the school teachers. Many of the problems that we can focus in on in ghetto communities have connections to problems that are located in neighborhoods that are as privileged as we could want them to be. And then there is the question of what our children are taught to believe in, if anything. We know they're taught to believe in getting good grades in school and high grades on SATs to get into institutions like this. What are they taught to believe in? The Bible is no longer part of their education. The flag is scorned by all too many of us. The texts have been deconstructed by the English professors. Believing in what? I go into elementary schools right here in Cambridge in the Martin Luther King School, and the teachers worry about how to teach values in a public school system. How to reach children in such a way that right and wrong can be taught and emphasized and conveyed, not only shouted at, but touched, the children touched by stories or whatever in there. They're afraid. Even in the private schools, and I was just in one very well-known one not too far from here, teachers wondering about what to do with all sorts of problems and how to teach children a moral life and how to get a moral life going that persists in the lives of those who will graduate from the school. I remember being a little playful a few years ago when I went to St. Paul's school. I was asked to talk with a lot of the teachers there, and I said, well, the first question I would like to ask is, is this St. Paul's school? <laughs> Whose school is it? And what beliefs inform the school? 
And the same thing can be said for schools all over this country, not only in our ghettos. Who has had success with a lot of the children and older people from the neighborhoods that Alex has been talking about? Need I remind you about the Muslims? Need I remind you how with some kind of religious fervor and something to, something to address the moral hunger and aimlessness of people, changes can take place. Look at the life of Malcolm X, so much a hero now for so many people. Malcolm X, at a given point in his life, was a jailbird, a two-bit, phony, a confidence man, a liar, a crook. That's what he was. And he did not change because he was uh, taken on in psychoanalysis or psychotherapy. What happened to Malcolm X? What happened to Malcolm X? He wasn't the recipient of a federal program either. No one offered him money. No one offered him any help of any kind that was legislated. It wasn't counseling in the prison that did it. Malcolm X somehow became part of a moral and religious movement. He was converted and then converted again. He went through two conversions. The second was a move from the Muslims to another kind of religious spirit. But it is interesting, the power of that moral and spiritual life to reach, touch, and reform him, and he is not alone. And as I think back of some of those families I knew under terrible stress, I, re I realize what they had. It's not something that the Congress can vote. Well, it is in a way, indirectly through its legislation, but they had a moral purpose. They had something to do and something they believed in. They were challenged. Life was made very tough for them. They had to go through mobs. They were spat at and threatened and heckled, but they wanted to overcome this. We shall overcome. And the same goes for the civil rights movement. The obstacles, in a strange way, sources of strength for so many people. We believe, of course, that we want for our children that they should have everything. We want to give them everything. And yet the story of this country, another irony, is that some of the strongest people in the country have been those who have come from, with very little from all over the world, in steerage, recipients of very little when arriving here, and have somehow found the strength against terrible odds to fashion a life for themselves and success for themselves. You bet children need to be fed. And you bet they need good medical care. And you bet they need better schools. But they need something beyond that. We need something beyond that. We need some purpose. We need values. We need something to believe in. And how that gets translated into the lives of children all children, not only black children or Spanish-speaking children or poor white children, but all of us is something that we ought to think about while we're thinking about America's children. What do children need? What do we need as we go through this life? I remember being in a favela in Rio de Janeiro, 
you can't get much poorer than those kids were. The most abysmal kind of poverty. And I remember talking with a nun about a young woman who left the favela to go to Rio de Janeiro to sleep around and make money. And she brought back her cruzeros at a time then when the cruzero had some value as currency. And she would tithe herself extraordinarily. She gave half, a third to half of her money to the nuns who ran a soup kitchen. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder how many of us would do this who are well-educated and psychoanalyzed and mature and privileged with plenty of money. How many of us? And she was not alone. The nuns told me that those children were keeping their soup kitchen going. They got more money from them than they did from the archbishop. Somehow those nuns and those children had the most astonishing kind of communication. I said to the nuns, do you know what they do to get this money? They said, yes, we know what they do. Can you stop them, I said. She said, never. Yet, somehow, doing what they did, and I can only imagine the names of people like me, correctly, correctly would apply to such children. I still remember their deeds and that soup kitchen. And then another story, coming back from South Africa with two of my sons who had been teaching in a school run by some Irish nuns in Soweto. You can't get more down and out than you can in certain parts of Soweto. Still voteless, shacks, lots of social disorganization and lots of psychological disorganization. The point is not to romanticize all this or to romanticize with nostalgia the past simply to remember the ironies. Those kids, and by the way, was children who initially in 1976 paraded in front of the Regina Mundi Cathedral there in Soweto and started what is now the South African approach to democracy with Nelson Mandela et al. Started by children in Soweto who decided that they would no longer study Afrikaans, not that language. In any event, those children were reciting to my sons, then in high school, what they were going to do with their lives. They were going to sacrifice, they were going to give up all sorts of possible hope and pleasure in order to fight and, if necessary, die. They had a moral purpose which they were only too willing to share with any of us outsiders. We came back to Concord, Massachusetts, a nice American town. And I'll never forget my son Bobby as we were going to the stationery store to get his school supplies notice a friend of his whom he'd grown up with who was sitting on the steps of the Middlesex County Courthouse waiting for a judge. And this young man would soon enough be standing before that judge. And my son said, this is a strange world, Dad. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, look, his friend has everything. Two parents, both of them very well educated, plenty of money, all the hope this country can offer such people, white skin, privilege going way back, and the kids were zonking themselves out and selling what zonks you out to other kids, and on and on the story went. My son Bobby said, this is strange. What did that friend of his, he'd grown up with him, what did he lack? There are connections to be made so that we don't isolate those Horner houses and isolate those young people whom Alex spent his time with. We are all part of a nation. 
We're all part of a nation. We all watch the same television, go to the same movies. Lots of these values are part of our lives, all of us. And yes, we had better try to find out how to help poor children who are vulnerable, who need doctors and better food and whatever. But we have to, I would argue, I would urge, connect this to all of us in a certain way. What we believe in, if anything, what we want, and how this has come about. Why is it that it is that when I go now to Roxbury, I am scared out of my mind? What kind of deterioration has taken place there? Whereas 15 years ago, where there was the same poverty and vulnerability, I could go there and be treated with respect and courtesy and kindness. Is that moral deterioration only a function of Roxbury? Or is there a larger kind of moral deterioration that may be part of all of our lives? And may, that even, and may we even find strands of it even in places like this. And let me conclude by thanking Alex for coming here in this university setting and teaching us this irony that in this country it is possible for someone like him with his skin color and his background working for the newspaper that he does work for to go out and link arms and find understanding with others so different and tell us about it and do this kind of observation and writing. This is an intellectual effort that was made. Why is this not being made more part of our lives in these universities so that there is a tradition for this and more of this kind of knowledge and research and understanding. There are many ghettos in this country, and not all of them are in the Horner houses. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Robert. Um, now with the most impossible task of all time, uh, Mary Jo Bain is uh, to speak with us. She is, uh, uh, has a PhD here from the Graduate School of Education. She's also director of the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy. She's also anxious to get on stage, but I have to say one other thing about her. I don't know why. I would not want to have to follow and talk about policies. Um, which is that she's been the, she's the designated commissioner of social services. She was designated by uh, Governor Cuomo for the state of New York, former deputy commissioner. And uh, <laughs> with any luck, uh, the Senate will confirm her shortly, and she will be the full commissioner and can work full time on all these various problems. Mary Jo Bain. Uh, I've now discovered the fate of lame duck directors of centers at the Kennedy School, which is to follow Robert Coles <laughs> on the podium. I'm reminded of a set of conversations that a colleague and I have been having with, a, with an editor. Uh, Rick Weisbord and I are writing a book on, on children and policies toward children, and our editor keeps telling us that the children are interesting and the policy is boring and would we please stick to the descriptions. <laughs> I think what I would like to do here in, in just a few minutes, rather than um, talk very long or indeed talk about policy, is articulate a, a question which I suspect uh, many of you were feeling as I was feeling uh, as Alec and Bob were talking. Uh, and that's the question of what can I do about the situations that Alec and Bob are describing for us. And let me speak for those among us who are neither content with doing nothing 
nor talented enough to tell the stories in the powerful way that Alec and Bob do, nor good enough, let's be honest about it, to follow Mother Teresa into a life of poverty and service. What can we do? Are those the only options open to us? Seems to me we need to ask ourselves a corollary of the question that, that Alec ended his talk with. He said, the guilty one is he who causes the darkness. Seems to me we need to ask ourselves, who is the praiseworthy one? Can we imagine for ourselves and for our world some roles that are praiseworthy that we can feel good about? Let me just make a couple of suggestions, and then I, I hope that Alec and Bob will be willing to, to talk about that, too, before we turn into more general question. I would suspect that, that there are indeed many praiseworthy people that they have encountered as they've, in, their work, in their work with children. The parents, the teachers, the cops, the welfare workers, Yes, the welfare workers, sometimes, not all the time. The priests. Many of the folks who work in the institutions that are too often silent, but which also often try. Can we give those people their due, doing hard jobs, often making mistakes? I think so. What about the people who manage those programs? Are they praiseworthy? Can we see ourselves in those roles? Is that sort of thing worth doing? Again, I'd like, I'd like other people's reactions, but I suspect the answer to that is yes. Can, do we have any praise for the people who formulate the policies and the politics? And for what people do we have praise or for can we imagine ourselves having praise for? And I'm struck by a theme that, that ran through both presentations that, again, I hope we can think a little bit about here tonight, and that's the theme of community, of one society, of bringing us together, of thinking of these problems not as problems of theirs, but as problems of ours. And, you know, those of us who are here at the Kennedy School are going to go off and do policy. We're going to be in politics. We're going to run programs. What criteria should we hold for ourselves? It can't be perfection. I know that. You probably know it, too. We're going to make mistakes. I'm going to be an ugly bureaucrat a lot of the time. The people who work for me are going to do nasty things uh, to people some of the time. What can we expect of ourselves, though? What can I ask of myself and of my department as we try to work on some of these problems? And perhaps the answer is that what we must do are things that build community, things that bring us together, policies that are inclusive, approaches to jobs that say, I'm here as part of the society, and you know, we all have our problems, and let's work together at it. Perhaps that's the kind of thing we can try to do as we think about roles for ourselves. I don't want to say any more than that. I hope that maybe other people would be willing to comment, and then we'll open up for questions. Thank you. Uh, just a, a, a couple of quick thoughts about, um, you know, sort of what people can do, and I think I have just re really two thoughts on that. One is I think that there's a way that we can somehow rebuild those, those personal bridges that we have somehow lost. Now, this is not an endorsement of uh, President Bush's thousand points of light, which I think in the context that's been presented has been a kind of institutionalization of indifference. And so I think we need to be careful about that, but I do think that there are ways that we can begin to rebuild those personal bridges and at the same time, once again, begin to discuss, begin to, to, to reinvest intellectual energy uh, into some of these issues, which I think we are beginning to do. I mean, I, to it, David Elwood and, and Mary Jo Bain, I, I, I think that in recent years we've begun to see that that, that 
intellectual energy reignite around these issues. And I think that those are sort of the two fronts I think we need to be working, both in rebuilding those personal bridges, you know, sort of expanding that sense of, of community and also really looking at what can be done in, in, in terms of policy. There are microphones on both sides, and is there a microphone also up there? I will uh, call on people who want to ask questions or join in the discussion. Um, Please identify <clears throat> yourself and keep your question short, okay, as okay. always. Um, I'm Dan Sealing, and uh, I have a question actually for, I guess, everyone, because everyone addressed it to some extent. Um, I, th it, I wondered if, in talking about the families needing to take responsibility and um, people um, needing a stronger uh, spiritual sense of, of uh, or at least a sense of values, a stronger sense of, of what is good, what is right. Uh, if that didn't somehow dovetail, and I get to the question in two seconds, if that didn't somehow dovetail with um, the comment that somebody's creating a certain darkness for the people, and my question was whether in not allowing um, parents a chance to choose where their children will be educated, that the children weren't lost, weren't um, denied a lot of nurturance at home because of that. Not, I don't mean that in a polemic way. I actually really wonder if, if, if the parents weren't allowed to be, if they're not allowed to be responsible, how can they then take pride in who they are and particularly act on what the children need? Bob, do you want to speak to that? Well, I'm. No. <laughs> I would. I, I feel very strongly that. Would first of all, I'm glad to hear you even use the word spiritual and uh, here or, uh, in this forum. So many of these problems ultimately are not only social and economic and political; they are moral and spiritual. And this is a great. This subject is a great embarrassment. I've noticed for a lot of liberals. Much easier, it seems these days, for conservatives to talk about these matters. Perhaps that's why they keep winning national elections. But uh, anyone who has gone in and into. Uh, neighborhoods of vulnerability. I, I'm thinking of some of the migrant farm workers. I, these are very hard-working people. They go all over the country in order to stay employed. They're not on welfare. They're getting no benefits of the welfare state. They are old-fashioned capitalists of sorts, putting their bodies on the line all over America to do back-breaking work, the lowest possible wages, it seems, but that's what they do, and they don't even have the protection of the Wagner Labor Relations Act in certain respects. And I've often wondered what keeps them going, and I can tell you what keeps them going. It is those hectic, fervid, intense religious moments on the weekend. It's Zora Neale Hurston knew what keeps them going. Their eyes were watching God. Well, not only God, one another, and it's very complicated, but there's a kind of passion there, not only sexual passion, but moral passion, some desire to find a better life and a better way of living that is not unlike what built this country up, all the people who came here, the same drivenness. And we, we, we need to understand what that was and still is in some parts of this country and still is in parts of what we call ghettos and still is in parts of the rural south. And then we need to understand the complicated relationship between that and leaving that behind in order to be part of the modern secular world, which offers a certain amount of money, some Medicare, etc. I'm not in any way suggesting that those aren't important and valuable, but I'm just trying to suggest this is a complicated matter of moving from one kind of world into another and leaving behind something and, and getting what? <laughs> 
and not getting what? And then stop and think about what we want for our children. Is what really matters for our children ultimately as we think about them, the privileges we offer them through our checkbooks? Is that what really makes us what we are? The people we admire, the values presumably we have for them, has to do with something else. And what is that something else? And what do we want for them? And how do we want them to be? <clears throat> My name is Allison Marie Johnson, and I'm a second year MPA student at the Kennedy School. And I must say that I was very inspired by all the speakers um, that presented to us tonight. And one thing that ran through my mind, particularly speaking about the black community, whether through your experiences and contact, several speakers referred to the transition from after the Civil Rights Movement till today. And I know from my own experiences and past and background and contact with all types of blacks living in all types of communities, that there seems to be a sense of loss of what to do after reaching the point of integration and whether what really integration has meant. And there was a time that blacks believed in the American dream. They believed that there would be a point that this dream could be reached for all of its all, of, all American citizens. And I wonder if the despair that was referred to and the lack of resilience and, and uh, mis just a lot, lack of hope and has a lot to do with many blacks, at least in the case of black Americans, losing a sense of being able to reach the American dream. And that used to be a sense of moral purpose or a goal or an objective of integrating into American society, becoming a part of the society, and then reaching the American dream of privilege and access to um, the rest of society. So. In some, my question would be whether, um, in particular, your contacts uh, and experiences have suggested the same sort of thing of what is the goal for people who live in those communities? What can be their purpose? You already have suggested that the purpose of people who immigrate is different. They're already starting out trying to get the American dream. They come here with that purpose, trying to succeed. So what is the purpose for those who've lived here all these years and believe that they perhaps we'll never have access to it. I'm reminded actually of what um, somebody had said the other week to me. She, she, she had told me a story of uh, visiting a school and uh, the teacher told her of a boy who had had a lot of problems and the teacher couldn't find any way to relate to the kid and the, finally she got the kid to stay after school one day and she thought the best way for her is to maybe talk about what he wanted in the future, what he wanted to do. And so she asked him what he wanted to be. And he sat there with his head down looking at the floor. And she persisted in asking him and asking. And she realized in his silence and his avoidance uh, um, that here was a child who had forgot how to dream, who had, who in, in some ways had lost I mean, as, as you put it, any sense of spirituality. I mean, had lost a sense of who he was and where he was going. And I think what we need to be able to do in these communities, and, 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 um, uh, and I don't mean to sound glib about this, but is to be able to provide some opportunities, to be able to allow children to dream again, to allow them to have some vision, because you see how quickly they lose that. And I think that's what we need to really, really work at. And I'm not sure I have a clear answer as to sort of where that first step needs to be taken. David. I, uh, no, I don't particularly want to speak to it, but um, I, think, I think there's a, a really deep part of that question because it's often said, I've often said, um, that we have to rebuild hope, that we have to find a way so that if you play by the rules, you don't lose the game, so that there's a future and all that. But in the end, it is true that that future involves getting rich, getting ahead, making it in America, having some money, having a future. And there's a funny sort of way in which that can be corrupting of the kind of spirituality 
uh, and deeper sense of person that I hear uh, Robert Coles talking about. And I don't have an easy answer to that. I think that having nothing is certainly worse. But it's not enough to say that what we need to do is build economic hope if we aren't simultaneously having some recognition for the other. Let me just say on the, con on the other side, though, I think the bulk of our social policies have been designed to, do, to dampen both to not reinforce a uh, sense of community, to not reinforce a sense of future, to not reinforce responsibility or independence or whatever, to pay their rent bills when the rent doesn't get paid, uh, to isolate, stigmatize, and humiliate. So I think there's a lot of places where we know how to go uphill. But on the other hand, you take white middle-class America where hope still lives brightly, and you still have the deterioration of the moral values and so forth that we talk about and how you get from here to there and where policy plays a role in that I think is, is for me at least, still something of a black hole. Um, my name is Hillary Norton and I'm a second year MPP at the Kennedy School and the themes that you had about giving children something to believe in and the death of responsibility in our society are very moving. And I thought that um, these children, while you were writing about them, believed in you. And they believed in your ability to tell a story about them and a story that, as you said, may even have outlived them, um, and possibly. And I thought, what have you given them to believe in now that you're not there? And what, um, what do we do? Um, and, and I think that college students actually, in my generation, are going in and personally doing a lot of, of community work. But what I see as a problem is that we sort of draw the community lines behind us as we move into the suburbs and feel that we sort of gave at the office or already put in the time in the larger community and now we're moving off into the smaller. And what do you think that how do we expand that responsibility? How can we start convincing that there is no no point at which the community only you know is your block, and that it's it is a larger community, as you were saying? This is for uh, anyone. <laughs> um, well, I can tell you that. Uh, for me personally, and this is just my own personal commitment, is I've made a lifelong commitment to the kids I've written about and will be there for them um, come hell or high water. But I don't think that that is, uh, 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 that is the answer because I certainly, uh, sort of unusual circumstances that allowed me to become so intimate with these children. One of the things that struck me about kids like Lafayette and Farrow was how they, so many people passed through their lives and how their life was so filled with disappointments. And I can remember early on when I occasionally would make a promise to them that I didn't keep. And they, like most kids, would get upset. But what struck me is that the first thing they would say to me is, you lie to us. Mm -hmm. You lie to us. And there's, once again, it's that sense, enormous sense of distrust and, and abandonment. Um, and so somehow we need to, to address that issue. And I think we most immediately need to address it in terms of the family. Now, having said that, I will tell you that the family is probably the most, has wreaked havoc on policymakers in this country because we don't have the first clue as to how we need to deal with families, what we need to do to strengthen families. And I think in some ways we're even afraid to really debate that issue. And perhaps that's one of the ways, one of the places that policymakers need to begin start investing some energy is what we do to help strengthen the family. I don't mean, doesn't mean keep a nuclear family, um, but find ways to strengthen families as they exist today. I can't see if there's anybody upstairs or not. If there's anybody upstairs at a microphone, do you want to say something? There's no microphone. Okay. If you want to say something, come downstairs. Okay. Um, you've suggested a couple of the things that we can do personally about these problems that you've discussed. And I, this is the second um, forum that I've been to. I was at the one on the National Commission on Children, and I left that and felt like, um, well, gee, there are all these people here, and we didn't talk about what each of us could do. And I'm sure we're all very motivated after something like this. Um, 
there is the issue of community involvement, but I, the more I've um, done community involvement, the more I've felt like I have to be doing more than that. And I never got involved politically, and I'm not uh, extremely involved right now. Oh, I'm a graduate student at Tufts University in Child Study, and it's, um, everyone who's a student here knows there's limited time while you're a student and trying to make money and live. But um, anyway, I just wanted to suggest that perhaps we have to um, take some responsibility politically um, and start letting our legislators know forcefully that we will not stand for what is happening and for the skewed priorities. We see them um, giving examples of, I mean, the savings and loan crisis and the, the, our willingness to spend the kind of money on that and our unwillingness to spend money on policies that benefit children and families. So if everyone here left and wrote letters to their legislators discussing these things and letting them know that we want them to provide a better example for all of us, um, I think it could um, do something and, and we have to continue that and keep the momentum going. But, and if you have any other suggestions of what we should be writing to them about and what we should be doing, I'd appreciate it. I guess I'd like to say just a, just a word about that. I, I often um, say to my students uh, when they're kind of writing their evaluations at the end of courses that uh, constructive suggestions are, are, are more helpful uh, than telling me how miserable and unhappy you've been in the course uh, throughout the semester. My guess is we might want to think about what things we can praise that our legislators and politicians and bureaucrats have done. I mean, it turns out that all of us hapless folks r respond well to being told that we're doing a good job and that we're doing, that we're doing things that are helpful. That's, of course, absolutely right. Uh, and, but I, I am suggesting that, that it may be worth trying to think about what are the things that are good as well as the things that are bad. Yeah, so they don't remove more of those programs <laughs> to provide support for them. I agree. Thank you. Okay, this will be the last question. Could I just oh, say that I certainly agree that we should write letters and we should vote, but I would hope that uh, that uh, even as busy as you and I are, that we can find the time to d do some teaching, to work in hospitals, to do tutoring, to uh, connect ourselves uh, for our own sakes as well as for the sakes of those we work with uh, to, to, to create these communities through the way we live and are. And I would hope that the universities of this country would be encouraging all of us uh, who are here to do this and uh, calling upon this activity as a means uh, for our own growth and understanding and even and yes our intellectual growth so that when we read a novel invisible man and have worked uh, in a w with some children in a school or, or become part of some um, agency's efforts that this is part of our education that these novels these stories these poems uh, have, uh, can be connected to the personal knowledge and experience that we are uh, gaining and that the two young people who are now so much a part of Alex's life, uh, the, the children like them can be a part of our lives and our lives a part of their lives for our own sakes, not only uh, civically, but Intellectually, yes, intellectually, we will learn more, know more, understand more. This has been a journey of intellectual discovery for someone like Alex. He has learned and known and now teaches us. That's what we can do with one another. Here, here. Last question. Um, my name is Julie Dunkel and I go to the Ed School. And I took a course in Understanding Communities where we read your book, Alec. And also I took Carol Gilligan's course, which dealt a lot with relationships. So my question kind of stems from those two courses. Um, I know that you talked a little bit about this, but could you elaborate more on 
your current relationship with Lafayette and Pariah and how that changed with the closure of your project? And could you also give us a little update on how they're doing? Um, yeah, I will give a little update, but I will also tell you uh, uh, right off that I'm going to be a bit vague, and that's because I feel some propriety about my friendship with them and feel some responsibility to protect their privacy now that the book is done so that they can move on and so that I can move on. But um, the family, in fact, moved out of uh, public housing this past summer uh, in part because of this uh, TV movie and some of the money from that and involved in uh, living in a neighborhood that is better but not without its problems um, and uh, involved in a program in which the mother of Lejo is involved in helping to construct uh, what hopefully will be a new townhome for the family. Having said that, uh, Pharaoh, who is now 13 uh, and in private school, um, still has ambitions to be a lawyer uh, and to be a congressman and he talks a lot about how he's and I think in part because the whole process of this book has changed his thoughts about what he wants to do with his life. He just, in fact, the other week said to me, he said, you know, Alex, I used to just want to be rich. He said, now I want to be rich and be able to come back and change things in the projects. Um, Lafayette is 16, which is a difficult age, I think, for any boy, and that much more difficult for somebody growing up where he's growing up. And without getting into it, he's had his share of problems. Um, and, uh, and I hope we'll do okay. Um, and I hope the the best for him. It's, uh, I'll tell you, he's a boy who still keeps a lot very close to himself and still, even two years later, finds it difficult, um, if not impossible, to even talk with me about the deaths of some of his friends uh, that happened during the course of writing the book. Uh, so he is a boy who still has a lot to deal with. Uh, some of the other kids who are in the book are not doing as well quite candidly. There's one boy, Ricky, who is 15, is now in a maximum security prison. Uh, there are a couple of boys, Isaac, the boy I mentioned in my talk, who is now fighting a drug addiction to heroin. Uh, and he is 16. Um, and there's another boy uh, as well who is now sitting in a juvenile home on a case of armed robbery. And, um, and these are kids who I've known for four, five, six years in some cases. Um, and it, it pains me to see what's happened to them. And it pains me even more to see all the attention paid to them once they get into all this trouble and that that attention wasn't there earlier. Could you say something about um, your leaving that project and what it was like for you and your relationship with these two boys? And um, Well, it's changed my life in, in a number of ways. It's, I think, the whole... The uh, spending the time down there, I think, made me a much angrier person. I think I tend to be probably somewhat of a, an eternal optimist and probably still am, but I think it's left me much angrier. Um, uh, and perhaps that's the only way I could avoid sort of uh, keeping from getting too depressed about it. Um, and the kids, you know, my relationship with them has been uh, extraordinarily important to them, I think, is, uh, as Bob sort of hinted at, I've, it's really informed me. Um, uh, about how I sort of carry on from here. That doesn't mean necessarily when I go to do another book it'll be on the same subject, but my experiences with the two boys have certainly informed my own growth, and I'm sure will continue to. Let me speak for all of us in the audience in thanking Alex Kotlowitz and Bob Coles for an extraordinary presentation.